morning. It's Brian David Marshall here with Randy Bueller on day two of Pro Tour Journey into next. Round nine is about to start. Only two players are left standing at 8 0. They're Patrick Chapin and Josh Hunter Layton. Randy Bueller, the first thing they teach you in draft school is don't hate draft. It's true. Because if when you take a card that you're not planning to play because, oh, it's so good, I don't want to play against this card. Well, you don't even know if you're going to play the guy who gets it, right? You don't know. You're going to get paired against somebody at random, and then they might not even draw it if you do get paired against them. So, yeah, hate drafting is not normally the right thing to do. But because this is a Swiss tournament, these guys are the only two 8-0s left. They knew they were going to be playing against each other. And you know what? Pat Chapin was looking at Pelucranos. He'd passed, you know, a fourth pick Goldenhine to Josh Utter Layton. And so he put the thing in his sideboard. Josh Utter Layton took Brimaz and put the thing in his sideboard. All right. But so, uh, Josh Utter Layton makes the first play of the game. A turn three Death Bellow Raider in his green red deck. Perhaps an indication that things did not go perfectly <laughs> for each of these players. Yeah, I, I got to say, hate drafting, normally not correct. I think these guys were strategically correct to do it, but it's sort of unfortunate. If they could trade, if they could just trade Brimaz for Pelucranos, their two decks would be so much better against everybody else at the table. Her Herald of Torment comes down for Patrick Chapin. And that's, that's a good one. And that's a problem here. Yeah, uh, Death Bellow Raider must attack, and must attack straight into Herald of Torment. Chapin's just got to make a soul read. He's got to look <laughs> over and say, do you have a trick? It's so bad when it's a Death Bellow Raider because they're not bluffing. Like, they're not representing a trick. Right. They have to attack whether they have the trick or not, and that somehow just makes it worse. And it's red-green, so there are only infinite tricks he could have. Yeah, Chapin describes the Death Bellow Minotaur as having a special ability. Its special ability is so good. <laughs> He just takes it? He does just take it. Unless he was doing the pen trick. <laughs> I don't have player audio in my ear for some reason. Can I get that? 1720. So 1720. So Patrick plays a land. Ordeal of Erebos. Oh. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't block either if I was ready to do that. Yeah. So here we take a look at hand. Cast of the Darkness, or Deal of Erebos. Which he just played. Burnish Heart. Oh, yeah. Necrobite and Sip of Hemlock. Yeah, you get a look at the ordeal. We know there's a searing blood in uh, Josh Utter Layton's hand. A coordinated assault, a fall of the hammer. Yeah, coordinated assault would have been the blowout last turn. Death Bellow, he, Josh had his back. He may he may need to go two for one here. What searing fall, searing blood, and fall of the hammer, or or coordinated four four. assault and fall of the hammer. Before oh, the counter, before the trigger. Before the trigger. Yeah. Yeah, it's currently a three three. So yeah, I think you're right. It's not even two for one, right? It's two for two. It's two for two. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm with you. I think you spend two cards here. He can't do it. searing blood. Can't be one of them because he only has two red mana. So it has to be fall plus coordinated assault. Coordinated assault, death bellow, traitor. Pad's like, uh, okay, I know something's coming. That's what's coming. I don't think Pat has anything to do about that, does he? Oh, well, we look at, look at. Chapin's hand, he can't cast the Necrobite. Oh, he's one mana short. Using the regeneration ability of Necrobite. And uh, can merely play a uh, yeah. Flesh Mad Steed. Man down. That Chapin. Or he can cast into darkness. Oh, no. Yeah, cast into darkness. Yeah, Death Bellow is now an 0-3 that can't block and must attack. So you can just kind of tap it and set it off to the side. <coughs> Chapin can block it at some point in the future if he ever wants to. Two cards. <coughs> There's a Swordwise Centaur. Turn five, right yeah, on schedule just, for Josh's that's deck. exactly one turn off schedule, I think. You, you think his expected value is about a turn four for the yes. double green Swordwise Centaur? It's like turn three and a half. Burnished Heart and Flesh Mad Steed. <laughs> Both players just it's such a motley collection of creatures. Yeah. So now we're going to see Searing Blood, I assume, on the Burnished Heart. Yep, yeah, tap your nice. Flesh Mad Steed. Take three. It's 
chance to get 11. in for three. Patrick's already at 11. And there is the dreaded Blade Tusk Boar. Blade Tusk Boar is very good in this format. That's about to get sipped, I think, though. Indeed. I mean, these decks are not spectacular, and that is... This is one of the reasons you're not supposed to spend your resources defensively drafting, right? Right. If you spend early picks just taking cards that are going to go in your sideboard, you wind up with less quality cards. Now, to be fair, the story's more complicated than that here. Neither player sacrificed much when they made those, right. those hate drafts. You know, Chapin had a very dry pack. Josh had a fairly dry pack um, when they counter drafted the Mythics out of each other's decks. But, I mean, that's when you're not getting cards for your deck out of those early picks, and you just wind up with this... You know, flesh mad steeds and death bellow raiders cruising by each other. Passes the turn with flesh mad steed ready to block. Yeah, and necrobite. Was he going to go block? Gets necrobite and gets dark. He's going to get star fallen. Yeah. Josh might be considering like the the main yeah he's considering the star preemptive, fall, star preemptive fall? yeah wow he wants to get in for five here and put Patrick on three necrobite but that's gonna regeneration is gonna tap the creature yes so Josh does accomplish three. the mission of getting in there for five it's a swamp for Patrick. Both players are out of gas, but one. <laughs> Josh on one. has one creature left. Oh. Would you like to pay tribute? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the draw phase. Not out of gas. Very much. Yep. Game one goes to Josh Utter Layton. Looked pretty convincing, too. Did. I mean, yeah, not, neither player came, came out of the gates necessarily uh, super fast. But we'll be back for game two after a word from our sponsors. Possess the power of Vintage Masters. Available exclusively on Magic Online, Vintage Masters contains Black Lotus, Time Walk, Ancestral Recall, the five moxes, and more. Magic Online Vintage Masters pre-releases start June 13th. Judge! Hi, Dude. how can I help you? How do you guys do that? Practice. You won't want to miss the conclusion of the pro season at Pro Tour Magic 2015. Invitations to the Magic World Championship and the World Magic Cup hang in the balance with the action starting August 1st from Portland. All right, welcome back. I think we're going to take a uh, live look in here while our main table guys continue sideboarding. And we're going to peek in on, uh, I think it's Raph Levy versus Conley Woods yep. in a green-blue mirror match. Hmm. Both players on six and two so far. Very yep. much in the thick of things. Raph on the left, Conley on the right. It looks like we may have had a mnemonic walled sea god's revenge going on here. Ooh. Yeah. Do we know the life totals? 11. Let's we'll see if we can get them. 11 to 10, sounds like. I see an hour of need in uh, Conley's hand. I Apparently that hour is now. So targeting the Siren means he gets a scry trigger. He's also paid the strive cost. So uh, the wall and... The siren turned into a pair of four four flyers. I need two. Thank you. Not bad? Yeah, no, not bad at all. Blocks everything on Raf's side of the board. Not all, okay. you know, okay. any of Raf's creatures on his side of the board. Sure. Now he chose to do that main phase. Uh, I think he wanted to scry, he wanted to make sure he got it in while Raf was tapped out. I mean, often the instant speed of that card is a lot of where the power comes from. Like, they commit to an attack, and then you surprise them right. with your 4-4 four, four flyers. 
But uh, it dissolved there would have been pretty... Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think Conley living in fear of some sort of counterspell from, from Raph Levy. Well, in fact, it looks like there is a dissolve in Raph's hand. Maybe he knows... Wow. Maybe there's some... Does he know that, or did he just put him on it? I mean, how would he know? There's not really peak effects in this format. It's not like he's got a... Not playing black for thought sees. Oh, it might, it might be a wave crash, Triton. That's a curse of the swine. All right, what is Levy going to do about those two four four flyers? Did you say? Did we say Levy has curse of the swine? Those poor, confused creatures. First, they were. First, I was a wall. <laughs> then I was a four-four flyer. Now somehow I'm a pig. Back down to the ground. Get them all ready. How many at least three? I'm not sure about the fourth one. Uh, Is he gonna upgrade one of his own creatures into a two-two? Yeah, it sounds like he's upgrading yeah. his. Uh, Opaline unicorn has done his job. Oh, two of his creatures. Yeah. And his. Uh, Omen speaker. Suddenly, Luke Rakota is king. It's four things. I get the mana from this guy. The uh, side, right? Yeah, but then I get like. I target and I get the oh, mana. Sounds like Yuya Watanabe has taken game one from Jared Butcher. Well, I'll let him figure it out. It's a good match. I do for four. I get mana from this guy and then there's all. Just tap for this four mana for this guy. Alright, sounds like we're ready to go back on table A. Uh. Right. So while well, well, these guys figure out. All right. Keep you updated on that. Let you know how that turns out. But sounds like Pat and Josh are ready. Great. So it looks like both players kept seven cards. Tormented Hero leads off for Patrick Chapin. Three times as fast as his previous draw. <laughs> Rest of his hand's kind of slow, though. Searing Blood and the second Mountain. Pretty yeah. solid. Again, the rest of his hand's a little on the slow side, but... Yeah, and you're just going to Searing Blood that right now? Yeah. Not let him get a third, play a third land for his Necrobite or... Exactly. I don't want to give him a draw phase. To, I don't even want to give him a draw phase to draw a trick. Yeah, he up, upkeep, upkeep seems sure. like the right play. Since the mana was untapped anyway, if he does have a two mana trick, get that out of the way now. Right, you at least time walk him there. Pat's uh, mono black hand. No planes, he, but no white most, spells. He's mostly black. He's it's only like playing ten seven, seven planes. Yeah, yeah ten seven. That seems to be the Ben Stark approved ratio Ten for two color decks, yeah. Yep. Okay. There's a blade tusk board. Uh, I'm gonna block uh, one of these here, First. the other two here, and then the other one here. So three, what? Three. A three three okay. here, a three three here. Okay. Uh, it's gotta become seven toughness. So I'm cast into darkness on the bore. So it just yeah, you know, it becomes like a uh, a little pinger. Yeah. He's going to get in for one a turn. Basically forever. Japen on a 17 turn clock now. Here comes Arena Athlete. We know uh, Josh has a pair of Star Falls. Oh, wow. Oh, he's just the one Star Fall. Looks like uh, Patrick just drew Drown in Sorrow. Yes, he did. Oh, nice. And decides to wait a turn, see Absolutely. if he can get a little extra value out of Josh here. Yeah, I mean, he's taking three down to 13. That's fine. You definitely give him a turn to play another creature. He might consider even a turn after this one. Oh, now he's got Burnished Heart. So now yeah. he can play the Drown, follow up with the Burnished Heart. That's probably... Place Burnished Heart, planning to block and then activate, maybe? Yeah. Yep. 
He's got three mana up, so Starfall can be responded to by activating the Burnished Heart. He's also got the Necrobite if he really wants to do that. Sure. Probably not with Burnished Heart since he's... <laughs> Yeah. You know, his second order strategy here is to set up that Drown and Sorrow. So Blade Tusk Bore, Rise to the Challenge, Starfall, Starfall for Josh Utter Layton. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. He's like, what is what does <laughs> Patrick have? The turn you draw plane, that's your play. <laughs> Yeah, Josh is confused by the fact that last turn was the first turn Pat played a Plains. So Josh believes that's the turn Pat first drew a Plains. And then if he finally drew his Plains, why does he choose then to play the Burnished Heart? So Josh doesn't understand why would he have been slow rolling this Burnished Heart? I mean, in fact, he was slow rolling the Plains, right? Yeah. Wow. It goes for Starfall. Yeah, just get out of the way. Just effectively clearing a path for the arena athlete. Burning his Starfall to do it. Patrick shocks everyone and goes, gets forest, forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a 5-5 five, five for you. One planes, one swamp. I don't love Burnished Heart, but when you activate it, it feels so <laughs> gaudy. <laughs> Especially when you activate it as a response to Starfall. That's like the best Burnished Heart ever. So Patrick takes three from the uh, attack, falls to ten which is almost as many lands as he has in play. Yeah. Probably can't really slow roll that Drown in Sorrow any longer, right? Nope. Isn't it time? Here oh, it comes. Planes. So Drown flooded this game. The Drown in Sorrow. And a Scry. Is that his other cast in darkness? I was going to say, you clearly push land, you clearly want spells, but some of the spells are not great. With Sip already in his hand, he's not interested in uh, casting any more darkness. Right. He'd like a creature to necrobite. <laughs> exactly. He'd like to unmulligan that necrobite in his hand. But Josh doesn't have anything either. I mean, Josh is on a trick and two removal spells. Basically, it's a weird kind. They're they're in top deck mode. I mean, they both have multiple things, but basically just top deck mode. <laughs> There's Swordwise Centaur. There's the Rotted Hulk. That seems to win when fighting Swordwise Centaur. Now, does Josh want to just go swing and try to get rid of that rotted hull, but it, he puts himself in a two-for-one situation? With to what, do Rise it? to the Challenge? Oh, he is Rise to the Challenge, yeah. Right. I mean, he's threatening. It got blocked, right? And now Rise makes it a five-power first strike. But Pat, we know, has Necrobite. Yep. Although that's basically just a one-for-one, one, since it regenerates... Uh, to the first strike damage, right. it's removed from combat and it does not get to kill the sword by centaur. Patrick gets a baleful idol on it, looks like. Not nothing.
can't. See, it feels like he still he has to play defense. He can't really bestow an attack. No, I mean he, he's a ten. I don't even think. Do you even bestow? I think you just. I mean, it would be tempting to have two blockers here rather than one giant blocker. But he goes the one giant blocker route. I mean, it's the better long-term play. Well, it is particularly good against Rage of Perforos. No. Doesn't, Rage of Perforos doesn't matter. Neither of those burn spells are big yeah. enough to take down even the uh, unenchanted Rotted Hulk. Yeah, these creatures just stare at each other. Wow, these decks are not impressive. <laughs> Both of these guys are hoping that all the packs at the table were terrible because their decks are not awesome. Now, that said, I didn't see them make giant mistakes in the draft. It's not like either of them passed an awesome deck either. No. Clearly, Pat didn't pass an awesome deck because he's playing against the guy he passed to. Sip of Hemlock. All right, Sip of Hemlock on <laughs> Swordwise Centaur. Yeah, I mean, he's, it's clear that Josh is out of gas, so sure. 13 to 10. Yeah, and he gets in for three. Plus the two from the sip, so. Yeah. And no no play from Josh. It's funny, game one, they just kind of traded cards, traded cards, traded cards, and Josh had the last creature standing and won with it. Is Pat going to do exactly the same thing here? Trade, 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 have the last man standing? Uh, here comes Nemesis Immortals. So Nemesis Immortals costs three, and it'll uh, monstrous costs, for it'll, it'll monstrous for six. So he's got enough to immediately monstrous it and make it a ten ten. Yes, he does. Wow, you sure do have enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> But again, the Baleful Eidolon yep. is going to keep that at bay. Reprisal? Oh, but Reprisal. Wow. First pick of the draft. It was. Yeah. Pack one, pick one. Reprisal is quite good in this format. I, mean, I think this format, talk about Blade Tusk Boar being good in the format. Reprisal is very good in this format. People like to turn, pile a bunch of enchantments, make yeah. somebody gigantic, and Reprisal that thing keeps that in check. That thing kills one drops. Right, right. <laughs> Oh jeez! Speaking <laughs> speaking of piling everything on one guy, that rotted Hulk has got super double death touch right now. I'm not sure that double death touch actually does anything. In fact, I'm beats. sure it doesn't. But <laughs> so, so, some mediocre beats, says hey. Patrick Chapin. Beats or beats? Yes. Yeah, I, Josh, Josh Arnold Layton would kill for some lukewarm borscht right now. <laughs> Not the beats I had in mind, but what are you going to do? <laughs> All right. Perforos' Emissary. Sounds like even Flock has defeated Matei Zadokai on a back table. Zadokai seemed to think his deck was terrible. He was like anything but an 0-3 he thought was going to be a success. Tax. Speaking Dauntless of successes. Onslaught. Yep. Dauntless Onslaught turns that four power into six, and that's enough. The lukewarm borscht gets there. So I think we're going to try to do. Uh, we're going to take a look at table D, which is going to be Yuya Watanabe playing against Rookie of the Year front runner Jared Snorlax Betcher. <laughs> so that's Watanabe on the right, Butcher on the left. Oh, it, Betcher turning his creature sideways. That can't be good for you, yeah. Lightning Diadem is at its best in green red. Said I, I heard Kel. somebody say that. <laughs> I've still not seen that card resolve, but I have now seen it in play, I guess. Oh, Triton Tactics. So first he tapped his guy with the black oak uh, to get a little bigger. Because Triton Tactics was going to untap it anyway. He doesn't uh, use the inspired trigger from... Uh, the Disciple of Deceit. Mostly blocking is what needs to happen yeah, yeah. here. 
What what kind of hydra is that on the top left of the screen? Is that uh, Hero's, Hero's Bane. Bane? Triton Tactics was kind of a blowout there. Do we know what game these guys are on? Game two. You use up a game. Yeah, Triton Tactics. I, I couldn't quite follow all the details of combat there. All I know is. You, you played Triton Tactics, and then Jared picked up three things and put them in his graveyard. <laughs> that sounds about right. It's the blue firestorm. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> Gets in with the... Nyads. Nyads. Those Nyads are quite good. I heard people talking yesterday about, you know, pack one, pick one. Yeah, Nyads. Sign me up. I'm not sure everybody has it that high in their pick order, but yeah. probably should. Hero's Bane could potentially become a 16 here. And uh, Jared couldn't get to his attack step fast enough. <laughs> and he's like, mm -hmm. hold on a moment. These guys are 7-1, right? Yes, they are. So this is pod 2. Oh, actually, I think. 6-1-1 one, one for? Yeah, you use 6-1-1. One, and one. Okay. So it's pod 2. There were not enough 7-1s. <laughs> um, Yu Yu was in the top 16, made it to table two. And yeah, Jared's 7 1. He's like, okay. So it puts the black oak in front. So it pumps once, becomes an eight. Yu Yu picks up a toughness. Doesn't trample as far as I know. Oh, he taps this guy. <laughs> he wants the oh. inspired trigger. Yeah. On the way out. Go. Inspired trigger, so he discards deep water hypnotist. So which means he can, you know, quote unquote transmute that for a two drop and he gets baleful idol on. That's a good one. <laughs> and you get the draw card. Pretty sweet. Well, it's called the draw phase. Yeah, it happens pretty draw much every phase turn. Draw phase is sweet. I'm it, it's very powerful. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong. I'm seeing lots of land in play in these matches. <laughs> oh, he ba he casts Baleful Eidolon, enchanting wow. the Hero's Bane, and then used Feast of Dreams to kill it, and then ends up with his Baleful Eidolon in play. Wow. That's how two-time player of the years play Magic. I like it. I mean, he could have left the Eidolon on defense and pointed the Feast at the Oakenheart, but this way he guarantees yeah, no tricks. There's so no much less that can go wrong here. Exactly, exactly. It's like any kind of removal spell to kill the Eidolon would have been such a blowout that Yuya's like, fine. I'm not willing to, to risk... I'm not willing to bet my game on my ability to block with my 1-1. One -one. Oh, is he going to trigger again? Is he... Is he going to... Nope. Did Nimbus Nyads also talk? Yeah, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, this looks pretty I, good for Yu Yu here. Yeah, I think, I think Yu Yu's got this. He's going to Nimbus Nyad his uh, Nyad <laughs> and get in for six. I think we can go back over to table A, watch our, uh, yeah, all right. watch our 2 8 0 players battling game three here. Here we go. We're underway. Patrick Chapin on your left, Josh Hunter Layton on your right. Only one player will come out of here with a 9-0 record that you get a look at Josh Hutter Layton's oh, resume. Sorry. And his hand. Yeah, Watanabe did win that game. Yeah. There's a Seder Rambler. Pillar of the War cast into darkness. Does that count as a combo? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. 
probably doesn't count. Does allow you to attack for one. All right, attack into the Pillar of War. Hmm. Yeah, coordinated assault. I think Patrick's content to trade Pillar yeah. for a card. Yeah. Especially a card like coordinated assault, which could just be exponentially worse. Yeah, the other nice thing that does is it forces Josh to tap mana, uh, right. which means he doesn't get to develop his board by playing another creature. Uh, turns out there was no creature coming down that turn. He didn't have the second red mana for the archetype. Um, but still, I like that play from Pat. Yeah, people don't block enough, I think. There's, there's value in forcing your opponent to go ahead and spend his trick. Yeah, no blocks this time for Patrick. And Arena Athlete Gene joins the red team. Block there would have been a two for one, right? Josh only had the panoply as a trick. Yeah. So it would have been uh, two cards believe to trade for the 3 3 Vigilance guy. I believe we're going to see. Yes. Bestowed. Six. Oh my. Herald of Torment, attack for six Vigilance. And that's why you don't block. Maybe you want a two for one your opponent, but you know what's better? Yeah. Gigantic. Braining vigilance him flyer. repeatedly about the neck and shoulders. Indeed. I think now he'd be willing to block. Yeah. Not sure I can see. Josh's so he, hand has... So he goes, Nature's pan Panoply, your guy can't block, get you down to 13. 12, 12, Patrick falls to 12 from the Herald of Torment trigger. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. What did he draw? <laughs> Century of the Underworld. Six. <laughs> have you at eight? Yeah. I have you at eight. Interesting. I have nine power worth of flyers now. Yep. No, he's not. He's playing defense. I mean, Arena Athlete is the scary thing that's going on here, right? <laughs> a cast of Cast of Darkness at Cast of Darknesses. Yeah, we saw a couple players yesterday go for the kill immediately and have it not work out. Pat's played this a little bit on the conservative side. I like his line. Yeah, he's like, I will take one here, maybe. And no. And not Josh is like, I'm not even going to throw my guy away here. Yeah, Pat's line plays around any number of tricks. Even if Josh could kill kill the... Uh... Oh, and he had Dauntless All Assault to win it that turn anyway. Yeah. Wow. That game was a blowout. Yeah, that was just resoundingly Patrick Chapin. Patrick Chapin, the last man standing. At King of the Hill. Hill. King of the Hill. He will be in the feature match again next round. We're, we're, we're going to see another, a Hall of Famer. In action next round, guaranteed. Yeah, true king of the hill at this point. Last yeah. man standing. The only 9-0 in the tournament. First place all by himself. And then you get a look at the floor, and you can see that the only match still ongoing is somehow this green-blue mirror match. Tell me that's not the same pig from when we last checked in. What game is this? Game two. All right. So it's a new pig. Conley won the game one. Okay. Okay. So commune, uh, commune with nature from uh, Conley, of course. <laughs> that his graveyard spread out in front of him, <laughs> sort of vintage dredge deck style. Yeah, it, it is. Commune. He Selects the that's mnemonic a, wall. That's a lot of mnemonic walls in his deck, by the way. So he casts that. He gets Sea God's Revenge. Oh, is that time of need? Hour of need. Hour, hour of need. need. Oh, hour of need. Okay. Yeah. So mnemonic wall's job is to turn into a 4-4 four, four flyer. Three to five. I'm at five. He's at three. Conley just leaving the... Hour of need face up. His opponent knows he has it. No reason to. There's all sorts of stuff going on here. Con Conley won that last game. Yep. Those are some life totals. 
Three to five. Oh, Levy has Colossal Heroics, yeah. Shipbreaker Kraken, but he knows he's playing against an Hour of Need. So he shows him what he's going to do. He says, I'm going to untap him. I'm going to play Colossal Heroics. Mm -hmm. One of the creatures I'm going to target is my Wave Crash Triton. So he gets to draw a card. He's got a Sphinx's Disciple. I have not a card we see. So he gets to draw an extra card. So Raph has done the trick of telling his opponent that he has Colossal Heroics, hoping to prompt a concession, and Conley is making him go through all the motions. Okay. Conley's like, yes, I've, I've done the same math you did, and you're, you're <laughs> correct. You have actually done the math. I w you win. <laughs> so, so we're going to see game, game three. three. Yeah. I, I, I think Colossal Heroics is one of the, the best limited cards in, uh, in Journey into Nyx. It is a good one. I'm not even sure it's the best green strive card, though. Like the rare that lets, well, yeah, you, I mean, lets the your rare, creatures the rare, fight? Yeah. I, I don't really, when I'm, when I'm talking about the best cards, that's always rares excluding rares, because you, right. you just see them so so infrequently. But yeah, like, I find that there aren't, you know, the strive cards definitely vary in power level. Colossal Heroics, we've seen, I think, two of the best non-rare ones here. Right. Between Colossal Heroics and Hour of Need. Those might be the two you, best. Now, I understand you were a little lukewarm on Hour of Need in Minnesota. Yeah, I... Hour of Need, it is situational, right? It has a dramatically high variance. It doesn't do anything if you're, if you're behind on board. You have to have creatures. And in, I mean, the dream when you take a card like Hour of Need is that you're going to be able to two-for-one your opponent. And so really sort of assessing the power level of that card comes down to how often am I up a card? Because inherently the card is card disadvantage. Right. I'm down a creature, and I spent this other card, and I wind up with a 4-4 four, four flyer. And it's like if all you're doing is converting one dork into a 4-4 four, four flyer, that's not actually worth a whole card. But it's an instant. I think the, the, the time it really started to go up in my value is sort of starting to play with the card and seeing how often, you know, they'll attack into you and you su your surprise 4-4 just eats their attacking creature. Right. So now it's not card disadvantage anymore. Now I've effectively traded one card for one card and upgraded my guy. And then, yeah, sure, when you get to actually pay the strive cost, upgrade two guys or, you know, the dream is... I'm fizzling your removal spell and eating your blocker, right. or I'm eating you're eating your attacker, or I'm eating two attackers. Then it really starts to right. kick in. Yeah, there's also times where you you actually use it on one of your opponent's creatures. Sure, downgrading it to a four four five. <laughs> downgrading it to a four four, or fizzling a trigger. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I I used it to fizzle a feel high uh, hide spirit binder trigger. Oh wow! So my opponent paid the mana. Uh huh. You know, on the inspire, and then it was like, okay, yeah, you have a four four there. You know, it was. Yeah, the relevant. topic. The, the potential things that you can do with Hour of Need are, I, I think, were always immediately obvious. But yeah, you're right. I think I underrated it initially because I underestimated how often you'd be able to get some other sort of card advantage by the timing of it. Right. But, but Savage Surge with Kicker, <laughs> which is Colossal Heroics. Savage Surge with Kicker is, yeah, much, it's much e less situational. Colossal yeah. Heroics, it's just easier to get off a good Colossal Heroics than it is to get off an Hour of Need. And, like, Colossal Heroics is a damned if you do, damned if you don't card. It's like, attack with everybody. <laughs> right. It's like, no, do you want to okay. block? Yeah, no. do you, you want to block? I'll blow you out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're not? Okay, well, I'll blow you out when you attack back. Right. You get a look, everyone in the feature match area, just waiting for this last match. Yeah, the other thing that Colossal Heroics does that Hour of Need doesn't do as well is triggering heroic stuff. Yeah. Like oh, although I've seen, I've seen people, uh, uh, one of the first times I saw it play, someone upgraded their Phalanx Leader mm -hmm. and one other creature with Hour of Need. Okay. And had other you creatures that all got trigger. the heroic trigger. Sure. But you often, if you have a heroic guy, you're pointing stuff at. You all usually right. don't want that creature to go away. We're underway... And that is Yep. Yep. Good. Okay. What's the creature in play there for Conley? Renowned Weaver, is that what it's oh, called? Oh yeah, yeah, Renowned Weaver. There you go. I could tell if it was that or the Sager Grove Dancer, but I guess yeah. it would have had a counter on it if it was the Grove Dancer. No, it came down turn one, Renowned yeah. Weaver. Okay. Wave Crash Triton. 
Oh wow! Look at this. Huh. We're going right. We're going right to four, and this is one of the things that you can do with Hour of Need. You can also go very aggressive with it. You can. Card disadvantage, but and we know that with all the mnemonic walls in Conley's say, deck, he can actually recoup that card disadvantage. Get the four, Hour of four Need back. Four flying mnemonic walls. <laughs> Yeah, Conley definitely Speaking just of, there's one in his hand. Always has a different approach. I love it. To a format. I mean, you barely see anyone playing mnemonic wall in this draft format. Right. You really I, And he he's recursing them with commune. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we have the hour of need fighting with Curse of the Swine. Hilarious. This interaction has come up way too often. <laughs> yeah, Conley say this interaction has come up way too often. It's so funny, like Con <laughs> there it is. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to upgrade my pig back into a bird. <laughs> this is just crazy. And there's his sixth land. Levy's holding Golden Hind raised by Wolves and the Colossal Heroics. Oh, and he's a Warwaring Siren as well. So he can actually do a little... He can get himself to do undo a little bit of that uh, bird damage. But you know, he plays uh, Nessian Asp. And that gets uh, countered. Nullified. Nullified. Looks like there's uh, shredding winds in his hand as well. Yep, there you, there you see it. One fourteen, right? Yep. Yep. All right, hour of need. <laughs> Pays the drive cost. All right, shredding winds takes down one of them. In from the sideboard, I'm sure. Card never winds up in the main deck. Oh, oh my. Go. There's Raised by Wolves. That's going to tap that down. <laughs> wolves, pigs. Uh, his golden hind to make his second green. There's his two wolf tokens. Looks like... Uh, yeah, the, locking down the spire spined 4-4 four, four flyer is quite good here. That is a gigantic flyer. Problem with spire spines normally that uh, doesn't add much toughness, but putting it on a big flyer takes away a lot of that drawback. Yeah, th this game looks actually... Solidly Raf Saver, especially Well he again, needs to tap it one more time, right? He's, but he's got the Colossal Heroics. Oh, sure. Right. So Raf can actually win the race. He can lock he locked it down once, now he can lock it down again. And that, that board is only gonna take two attacks to finish Conley off. Is that right? Oh he was considering oh yeah, now he's got the second two, four, green. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's eleven damage, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh Conley needs to be it needs to attack okay. one time. Can Raf trigger the Wave Crash Titan? Yep, there's the Colossal Heroics. He's going to do it on Conley's upkeep. Yep. Sure. Wow. Conley draws a forest. Yep. Wow. Wave Crash Titan. I have a whelming wave. <laughs> he has a whelming <laughs> wave, too. What are you talking about? Of course about? he does. <laughs> that would have been awesome. All right, so it's Raf Levy that moves oh, to 7 Raph and 2. Hall Conley of Famer Raf Levy. Conley picks up his third loss of the tournament. I was hoping to draw a whelming wave, so I didn't die. I was hoping to draw a whelming wave. 
I was hoping to draw whelming waves. Yeah, you wouldn't die. Yeah. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps that should not be mission one in a game of magic. Well, no, he was hoping to get to attack with his giant lethal flyer. Yeah. Welcome back to the booth, Brian David Marshall, Randy Bueller. Some good matches. That, that was that was a that was a pretty epic kickoff to day two here at Pro Tour Journey into Nix. Fair. Uh, we saw Patrick Chapin go to 9-0, the yes. true king of the hill. Indeed. Uh, defeating Joshua or Layton. Uh, Yuya Watanabe, we saw him uh, pretty soundly trouncing uh, Jared Betcher. Yes. So Jared picks up his second loss. Yeah. And Yuya's X1-1. Yuya's, Yuya's in that kind of like lurking mode at X1-1. and one. You know what I mean? He's just going to be below, just below that top of the top of the pack. Yeah, the draw is fine for him, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it's X3 it's and 1 at the end of the day is going to get in. Yeah. I mean, the way we had about 350 here, it's a little bit lighter than the Valencia attendance. So probably somebody's going to make the top eight with, with four losses. Maybe a couple somebody's. Right. And then, uh, so I've, and Ivan Flock was our last feature match. We didn't really get to look in on them at all. But Ivan Flock stays alive at 6 and 3. Yeah, he over Mateus Adelkai. Adelkai dealing a fatal blow to team coverage. Yeah. So. Sounds like we have an interview. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna check in with uh, Hall of Famer Raf Levy here. So uh, we're gonna send it down to the floor, and uh, Tim Willoughby. Thanks, Tim. Hi, I'm Tim Willoughby down here on the floor with Raphael Levy, who's just defeated Conley Woods in a pretty complicated looking blue green mirror. There, so many different tokens, Raf. There were spiders, uh, boars, sphinxes, wolves. I'm probably missing couples. I, I don't remember. Like that. Uh, Curse of the Swine, it seemed like it was the real trump card in a blue-green mirror without very much removal. Like, how high do you pick that sort of a card in a blue-green deck? I, uh, it's not exactly my favorite card, but since my deck is so, likes a lot of, I don't have any removal, it's my only removal card. So if a creature is, uh, is bestowed by, I don't know how many bestowed creatures, that's my only way to really come back into the game. And I have a lot of uh, mana creatures. So in the later game, like the unicorns, I can turn the unicorns to two twos. That's also something good. And uh, yeah, against the sphinxes, that was great. Yeah, we saw quite a few sphinxes coming into play there, but a few little magic tricks. That, you know, we had one creature turning into a sphinx, then turning into a boar, and then all sorts of craziness going on. But Raph Levy able to power through that one now. You're now seven and two, uh, and we've got two more rounds of draft, after which it's back to constructed here at Pro Tour Journey to Nix, heading back to the booth. Thanks, Tim Willoughby. Uh, yeah, sphinxes, boars, <laughs> every every kind of uh, token, you know, really taxing the judging staff there. So like, oh, yeah? Well, do you have enough of these sphinx do, tokens? Do you have one of these in your binder? <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going we're gonna to go back to the news desk, uh, and then we're going to go scout around and see who we're going to look at in round 10 here at Pro Tour Journey to Nix. Let's send it back to the desk. All right, thanks very much to Pro Tour historian Brian David Marshall and Hall of Famer Mr. Randy Bueller. Rich Hagen here at the news desk. A couple of results to bring you. I watched Reed Duke out on the floor defeat Ricardo Sanchez Garrido by two to one, so Reed moves to eight and one. Sanchez Garrido, by the way, 50 50 across 10 Grand Prix lifetime. This is his debut PT, and isn't he doing well? He's sitting there, though, at pod one, no escaping all those sharks in the water in pod one for him. So he needs to pull round after that first round loss. Darwin Castle, eight and one over Joel Larson, now down to seven and two. Guillaume Waffa Tapper wins again. Raf Levy, who you've just seen there, remember, he went 5-0 and oh in Constructed. He loves his deck. The team he's on, Revolution, seem to have a really sweet deck. He's going to talk to us about it later. If he can get at least one more win out of draft, obviously ideally two more, but even one more, that would put him in potentially great shape for a run at another Pro Tour Top 8 for the Hall of Famer. Yuya Watanabe, meanwhile, 7-1-1, very much lurking just behind with the draws over Jared Butcher, but still none of these guys are out. Why don't we take a look at the overall leaderboard for you. There you see it right now. Now, of course, still results coming in, so there are people going to go above this here, but four eight and ones. Darwin Castle, Andrea Mangucci, Reed Duke, Andrew Beckstrom. You've got a 9-0 and uh, coming your way in the form of Josh Utter-Layton. Um, 
uh, sorry, uh, uh, Chamin with the 9.0. Uh, so that will get updated. The seven and twos you see there, Scott Markerson uh, down the bottom there with Michael Majors at seven and two, Marcelino Freeman uh, of Mexico. Brian Upham, I haven't mentioned him uh, so far this weekend. He is amongst the seven and twos. We'll update that as the last results come in. But uh, with the news that Patrick Chapin is your lone nine and oh, well, my question is, so what now?